Did you know Amazon provides ways of working that fits your lifestyle? They know you value your time outside of work, juggling family, school, friends, or other activities. That's why they offer a variety of shifts that work for you. There are full-time, part-time, and even temporary opportunities that can work with your schedule. With great starting pay and sign-on bonuses, if you want a career that fits and adapts to your lifestyle, head to Amazon.com slash apply. Amazon is a proud equal opportunity employer. Are you ready, kids? Get your parents' permission, check your mailbox, and grab your shopping cart. It's time for the Adventures in Collecting podcast. I'm Eric. And I'm Dave. Welcome Welcome to Adventures Adventures in Collecting, Collecting, where we talk toy news, culture, and hauls, along with our journeys as collectors. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Adventures in Collecting. Hi. Dave, we're back. We're here. We are. And you know what? Uh, I have a question for you, Dave. Okay. Let's, do, let's hear this question. Do you know what knowing is? <laughs> I think I mentioned this uh, on a previous episode. I think you I did too. I believe it is half the battle. That's true that's right it is half the battle and uh and do you know do you know what i'm not gonna do well i've i've considering that i i've already won half the battle i know that you are not going to bury the lead that's right dave Uh, i am not gonna bury the lead uh we are back with another guest this week and uh and this week We're excited to jump back into the world of all things Hasbro. After starting with the company in 2019 on the PlaySchool Action Brands, our guest today transitioned to the role of brand manager on Power Rangers, accepted a special mission to work with friend of the pod Lenny on G.I. Joe, and breaking news, Dave, is now also a marketer on the Fortnite team. Joining us today on the pod is Associate Brand Manager at Hasbro, Emily Bader. Yo, Joe, and welcome to the show. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. It is it is our pleasure and and as on that late breaking news, congratulations on your uh your 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 new hat to wear. Thank yes. you. Congrats. It's, I'm very very excited about it. So, while while we we already have the interview structured for for GI Joe and Power Rangers, this just means that that we're going to have to have you you back on again in in the future to do uh to do some Fortniteing. Perfect. I know a lot about Fortnite now, so I'm really killing it. <laughs> We we clock in quite a I've, few hours. I've learned so much over the past six months. Yeah, Dave. Actually, I think you play more than I do now. Mm. I, I think. Yeah, I, I was. Think I was on. A, I was on earlier. <laughs> but anyway, before we get into uh, into all of the kind of meat and potatoes of the of the interview here, uh, before we get started, we ask all of our guests, as this is a show about collecting, what are you currently collecting, Emily? Yeah, so I thought I'd kind of let you guys pick which one you wanted me to elaborate on. I came up with, I kind of looked around my house. I was like, all right, you can ask me this question. What do I collect? So these are your six options to have me talk a little bit more about. So option number one, Cycladic Idols. Option two, Vintage Pyrex Bowls. Option three, Harry Potter Books in Foreign Languages. Option four, Seashells and Sea Glass. Option five, fancy handbags. And option six, cats. Huh. I know, right? Which one are you going to choose? I know that we're talking about toys, so I kind of wanted to, like, throw in something weird at the beginning. I, Dave, do you, ha- do you have a, a preference? I mean, if option A isn't coming up at the end, then let's, let's talk about it now. Oh, yeah. any of them can come up at the end. It's your choice. You can pick any of the six to show up now and any of the six to show up at the end. I think I, I think I got to go with option A, only because I don't know what it is. Yeah, I, I would like <laughs> to learn more. <laughs> I love this. Okay, so as a little bit of backstory about me, I did my undergrad at a liberal arts college. And, you know, as many of us when we're 18, didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life. Um, but my first term, I ended up taking two classes that I really liked. 
One was a sociology class and one was a class about classical studies, which is basically the study of the ancient world, um, mine mostly focused on like ancient Greece and ancient Rome. And uh, I ended up getting a – I have degrees in both classical studies and sociology, but Cycladic Idols kind of pertain to the classical studies part. So Cycladic Idols were these marble statues that were created in the Cyclades, which are this kind of island chain around Greece, from like 3000 to 1000 BCE. Um, Typically out of marble, we think that they were probably also some made out of wood, but they're these – So they're kind of like, most of them are standing figures, but they're really simple. It's like kind of an oversized head and a body. And the majority of them that you see are figures that are standing with their legs together and their arms kind of crossed over their chest or stomachs. And the crazy thing is we don't really know what they were for. So they show up everywhere in like grave sites that people have found. They show up in like towns that have been excavated. But nobody is entirely sure what their purpose was. So you see idols that are standing. You see idols that are heart players. You see idols that are seated. You see them with cups. And so for me, it's like this kind of really cool mystery that's about them. But also, fun tidbit, in the Victorian era, they were like really cool house decor. And so a bunch of people went and robbed graves in the Cyclades, took all the Cycladic idols and sold them to rich Victorian people as house decorations. And since then, they've kind of made their way to museums, but we don't, like, we have no idea where their origins are. And so there's all of these pieces where it's like, oh, this is so cool. If only we knew what grave these were robbed from so that fancy Victorian people could have these in their houses. So anyway, I really like these. Um, They are in museums all over the world. Whenever I travel, I make it a point to go to art museums and see their Cycladic idols. I have maybe five or six replicas of the ones that I've seen. Um, There's a Cycladic idol museum in Athens, which is amazing. The Getty Villa in Malibu has a really cool heart player. Um, The Louvre has this like giant one that's just a head. Oh my God, guys, they're so cool. So thank you for allowing me to have a moment of classical studies nerddom. Um, I assume this happens like every week. (laughs) <laughs> this is these awesome are cool um yeah i'm looking these up right now <laughs> right there and i assume that's what everybody's doing they're like and what is this lady talking about cycladic idols they are so cool i i i am i have i have now gone down the rabbit hole uh-huh you you will keep going too and but it's really important that you know that the first time you see one in a museum you're gonna look at it and go oh that's like way smaller than i thought it was gonna be <laughs> Because that is exactly the feeling that I had. I've since gotten over it. But they're like, I think my biggest one is maybe 12 inches. So like they're fairly small. So you'd be able to like hold them in your hand. So so we're looking at like 118th scale. Yeah, basically. <laughs> to, to put it, to put it in, in toy, in toy terms. terms. Yeah. Way to bring 18. it back, Eric. I, yeah. I, I'm and there's some variability about sizing, too. It doesn't have to just be, like, some of them are a little bigger, some of them are a little smaller, some we just have heads, some we just have bodies. Um, yeah, but I would have thought like, these were enormous. Yeah, no. They're not like the, the like, giant Easter Island statues. I want them to be, but they're not. Um, but they're still like, really cool. <laughs> I just found one of a man sitting. I yeah, like and so interestingly, we think that most of them are female forms because of the carving on them. But, like, some of them might be males, but, again, without that context, we don't know. We, they may have been painted at one point. Like, all of those beautiful, amazing marble statues that exist from antiquity, all of those were painted at one point. Because we look at them now, we're like, oh, the white, they're so sophisticated. But they were painted in, like, garish rainbow colors. <laughs> um, which I, I was always like, oh, these are beautiful. I would have loved to have gone to a temple and been surrounded by serene white marble. No, no, no. They painted that stuff. Like, they painted it like children having fun at a rainbow party with, like, finger paints. I mean, it was it was dignified. They were artisans. But, like, the first time you see one, you're just like, oh, my God, what what is this? Man, like... I this question is ha, has I think it's become my actual favorite question of of the interview every time because we have gotten some some answers. Do I and rank we, up there? Is this one of the weirdest ones you've gotten? This is 
definitely the weirdest. Yes. We haven't even gotten to the what's the weirdest thing you have question yet. <laughs> That's a we'll good. Get to oh that yeah. Later. We might have played this wrong, Dave. We might might might, might have play, might have saved this one for the end. No, no, but, I'll uh, I'll tell you the the strangest thing I have. I'll I'll let you stew in this for the entire interview, and then when we get to the end, I'll tell you the story. It's my bride doll, my broken bride doll. Oh, okay. Yes. Who I'm pretty sure is haunted, and I keep in a place of honor in my home because I think that if I anger her, she'll like bring all sorts of like terrible things down upon me so think so, of, think about that until we get to that answer so dave would you like to hit her with the final question <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh man all mm-hmm. right i have so, a, i have an in an eclectic what was the phrase that my friend used it, my decor is very eclectic and it is very um representative of all of the places that i've traveled and all of the different things that i have done in my life I love that. I mean, that's yeah. what that's what a collection is supposed to be. Whether it's whether it's uh, you know action figures or cycladic idols or yep. a box of doll eyes, it's supposed to you know represent who you are. So hey, she awesome. only has two eyes, and they are attached to her head, so it's not necessarily. But I did have when I was on Power Rangers, I had you know they come with all of the extra parts and all of their hands, and I and all of their extra heads, and I definitely had a bowl of hands and heads for all my Power Rangers. I it still, I, I have a fishing tackle box that's filled with various. Oh my God. That's appendages. so smart. Cause then it's organized. Mm-hmm. All Ooh. the left hands, all the right hands. Mm-hmm. That's skin really color. nice. I yeah. might take that idea. That's good. I do love, I, anything that I can like go to the container store for is like really up my alley. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. All right, Dave. Let's let's head into the uh, let's head into the the world of Hasbro here. Yeah. Um, so tell us how you found your way into the uh, toy industry and to Hasbro. Yeah. So I have kind of an unorthodox background for the toy industry. So as I mentioned, liberal arts college, degrees in classical studies and um, sociology. And so, what does a nice West Coast girl do with her liberal arts degree? She works at nonprofits. Um, so I worked in the nonprofit sector for five years. I was the program manager for a program for high school students at the Science Museum in Portland, worked in marketing at a little boutique theater, and then I found myself at a cat shelter. And I worked on the floor, worked my way up to being in the development and communications office, and got to start doing some marketing things. Um, It was a really small company. I had never really taken a business class before, but I knew that I was really liking what I was doing. And there wasn't really any upward mobility because of how small the company was. So I decided... I was going to go to business school. Um, but one of the things that I was really like internally struggling about was feeling like I was going to be a sellout in business school because it had always been so important to me to you know give back to the community and do something that was really going to make an impact on the world. So when I got to school, one of the things that I started, they started having us, you know, research companies that we may want to interview with and work for. And so one of the things that I was really looking for was uh, corporate social responsibility statements. So I wanted to see everybody's CSRs. And when I was talking to the company, I basically wanted to see if companies were putting their money where their mouth was or like actually following through on these beautiful, elaborate CSR statements on their websites. And Hasbro was one of the companies that I really felt was actively trying to make a difference through their products um, and what they were doing and being able to say, like, the fact that we all take, so Global Day of Joy in December is one of my favorite days, one of everybody's favorite days. Everyone in the company, globally, all takes the day off work and goes to volunteer in their community. Um, and I just think that that is, it's so cool that a company is willing to shut down operations for an entire day and that the goal is to have everybody in the company out volunteering. So it's like, like literally everybody, like all of the C-suite is out volunteering. All of my team is out volunteering. And it just, it made me feel so good. Um, And so that's actually how I ended up choosing Hasbro. Um, So I interned there on the Play School Heroes team, um, which was a ton of fun and couldn't wait to come back full time. So, so you mentioned uh, play school there, but b- before we we learn a little bit more about that, uh, the the day of giving back that 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 Hasbro does, I love 
when that comes up every year because the especially the way that kind of the social media account covers it. And I remember one year, I think it was I think it was when we had we were we were starting to kind of work with uh with Steve Evans to, mm-hmm. to come on the show. Oh, he's great, yeah. Um it, we were actually plan like trying to plan the day to have him come on. And the one day that like was on the schedule that we were playing with ended up being that day. And that was our kind of our first experience where he was like, well, I can't do that day because of this Mm -hmm. and explained what was going on. And then we saw the pictures on social media and, you know, like everything that that you guys were doing. And it it really is a really, really cool program that I I feel like not a lot of people know about. Like Hasbro should be be very proud to, you know, to do something like that. It's pretty amazing. And there's there's this huge kind of emphasis on giving back to your community. So we have all of these opportunities for like getting matched with nonprofits in our area. So like that our skill sets can help, um, which is like a non-global day of joy thing, but that we can do all year round. You know, one of our benefits is that we can get time every month if we're full time to go and volunteer, um, which is amazing. When we're in person, um, there is, you know, activities that we can go to monthly where we actually get to go as a team and volunteer places. They've been really good about doing virtual events too. Um, but it was, it's one of the things that I just think is so cool that so, like a company that's this big cares that much about making their community a better place. It's amazing. So, so, so going back to, to play school there, um, you know, as an, as an intern, you had the opportunity to, to work with a bunch of different licenses on, under play school since they work with so many, you know, so many different licenses. Mm-hmm. Uh, what were some of the things that you learned, uh, you know, in, in that process? Yeah. So for those of you who don't know, the now defunct Play School Heroes brand um, was the basically preschool action brand. So it was the preschool lines for, I always have to count them on my hands because I forget, for Star Wars, Marvel, Transformers, Power Rangers, and Ghostbusters. Um, And so this was my, this was really like my first corporate work experience, which taught me so many things. But I think one of the really amazing things was that I got to see all of the subtle nuances of how all of these different brands worked. So like what appealed to these consumers didn't necessarily appeal to these consumers. And I was there right as we were kind of transitioning sizes of products. So we had been doing kind of smaller figures. I Maybe three inch. I want to say three inch. They were little, little friends. And we're moving to like a a five inch and a 10 inch for preschool. And so it was so cool to kind of get to watch the 10 inch were the mega mighties, um, which are kind of these chunky figures. They were $9.99. They were great expressions. And we also did ultra mega mighties, which were like slightly fancier ones. I think they were like 12 inches maybe, but they were just like these chunky, great expressions that little hands could really get a hold on. They were great for like crash and bash. The colors were amazing. They were all these like really kind of friendly preschool designs where, you know, if you had like a whole wall of them on your shelf, which I definitely did at my desk, it like it made you feel good about having these as your toys. And honestly, like I just thought it was so cool. And so that was really one of my first deep dives. And I think it was really there that one of the things that's really important to me is I love learning and I love asking questions. And it was so cool to be around all of these different people with these different skill sets. One of my favorite things was sitting and watching our product designers work because they could see something in their brains and then it could like magically appear on the screen in front of them, which is just not a skill set that I have. I can make you the best stick figure you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> but like my, I, my, that's not how my brain works in terms of ID, like making ideas happen. And it was a really wonderful opportunity for me to get to learn like all of the different functions at Hasbro, what everybody's parts were and the importance of making sure that, you know, all of the communication is working between everybody so that everyone's ideas are coming together. And it it was an amazing experience. I absolutely loved it. And then we did coffee and ice cream train after lunch. So like the team would hang out at lunch. And then at one o'clock, we would all start banging our cups and we'd all walk down the hallway to get coffee and ice cream after lunch and then walk back and go to work. And I think about that sometimes when I'm at home by myself working from my home office and at one o'clock go and get ice cream. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> Sorry, that was a long-winded answer. But I learned a lot of things when I was an intern, um, and it was it was a really great opportunity. It's it's always so interesting with the the kind of uh, core kids lines, or you know, or even the you know the 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 preschool lines. It's so interesting to see you know characters and properties kind of translated into those more kind of like simple figures. I mean, the the things yeah. that we you know that we grew up with playing, right? Like like even even something like you know the the modern you know uh, Marvel Legends that that Hasbro produces, right? Like they have the Titan series and the you know the the other core kids lines that mm-hmm. like attach to the movies and everything. And it always gives me those kind of like old school like Kenner vibes you know they always have like the fun mm-hmm. extra accessories yeah. and play features and you know all of the things that are are you know taken out for kind of like the collectors or collectible uh you know market because when you're a kid you want you want your you know figure to fire a giant foam yeah. rocket you want the storytelling and, like that yeah. and being able to immerse yourself in that world is so important and I think also to an extent you know we focus on that a lot on the fan focused brands too. Like we, especially with like the heyday that toy photography is having right now, everybody wants to be able to tell their own unique version of their story with their toys. But I think that it's, it's so amazingly cool to see all of these different interpretations of the same figures because nobody's pictures look the same. Everybody has different ideas of what they want things to look like and how they can bring things to life. And it's art. It's an amazing artistic expression, and it brings the entire team. It brings everybody at Hasbro. I'm just going to go ahead and speak for the entire company. So much excitement to see how people are interacting with our products and how they're really making them their own. So, prior to diving into the trenches with the Joe team, you worked on Power Rangers. How did that opportunity come your way? Yeah. So I graduated from business school in. Spring of 2020, which you may remember was at the very start of the pandemic. So you can imagine like not a lot of jobs to be had. So I hung around at home. I volunteered with a couple of organizations virtually. I logged like 400 hours in Skyrim. Um, and <laughs> and one day I got a call um, from uh, Joe, who ended up being my boss, saying that he had um, John Firestone on the Power Rangers team needed to go on paternity leave and they needed some help. And my boss on Play School Heroes had recommended me as somebody who might do well. And so I interviewed and uh, started on the Power Rangers team. So I truly lucked out. Thank you so much, Shannon, for the recommendation. Um, Shannon, who is uh, currently leading up Spidey and Friends and is an amazing human and toy marketer. I'm so lucky to have gotten to learn from her. But that it, I truly, truly lucked out um, for the opportunity. And it was interesting because I, like, the lease on my house was up in New York. I didn't really know what I was going to do. My parents said, come, you know, how long is, how long's COVID going to last? Just come back to Oregon for six months. You'll figure it out. Um, and so I actually got the job offer right as I was moving back to the West Coast. Um, so I did it all virtually working East Coast hours from the West Coast which meant I was waking up for meetings at 6 a.m. Um, people were very nice. They usually didn't schedule meetings that I had to present at until like 7 a.m. my time. So it was kind of them. But working on Power Rangers was was amazing. It was my first real introduction to fan product and how passionate our fan bases can be and how enthusiastic and how much they are, how vocal they are about the products that they want and what they think we're doing well and what they think we could be doing better. And it's so cool to kind of get that feedback in real time about your products and being able to say like, all right, so this worked, this didn't work. What do we want to do next? How can we, how can we make this a better experience for our fans and our consumers? Um, But it's, it's, was really cool on Power Rangers. One of the big differences between Power Rangers and GI Joe is that Power Rangers are screen accurate. Versus G.I. Joe is kind of like this mishmash of so many different iterations of these characters and then Lenny's like amazing brain of modernizing all of them. And so it was really interesting to be able to say, okay, well, so on this ranger, his shoulder pads actually shoulder pads. They don't have shoulder pads. Ignore that. Um, (laughs) (laughs) I, I said that in one of my first fan first Fridays, the first one I ever did in October Um, It was a Power Rangers one, and it was, I think, like, 
we revealed maybe an astronomer and she had like this cool body armor on and I called it shoulder pads. And I was like, look at her cool boots. I was talking about it like it was a fashion thing. Um, Dancing feet, right? Dancer feet. Ballet feet. feet. It was King Sphinx. He had ballet feet because of how great his ankle articulation was. I actually have him sitting on my shelf right now. That's really funny. Um, Everything comes back to Power Rangers, guys. Um, But it's – what was I talking about? Oh, my gosh. Screen accurate. Um, Versus just kind of the the, the, the – realizations and, and, and different versions. And so it's it's been really cool to get to work on brands that are kind of both ways. Where on Power Rangers, you know, we spend a lot of time looking at very grainy still images from 1993 for product, um, which, and we try, you know, the team is so amazing. Loretto l- working on Lightning Collection and Jordan working on Kid Product are absolutely slaying it on all of the Power Rangers stuff. I don't know if you guys have seen any of like the Dino Fury stuff that's been coming out, but... They're doing great. <laughs> yeah, that 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 core yeah. kids Dino Fear, like uh, the the thing with the color changing. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Bananas. Dino Fury saber. Mm-hmm. Like I I still am not quite sure how how that actually works, and I Magic? as a kid I would I literally would my jaw would be on the floor. Yeah, I got to do um, one of the early test rounds for the Chroma Fury. So they sent me. So I was living on in Oregon. So I get this package that's like an early test model of this thing. And one of my jobs is to figure out, you know, all right, what is this? What does this work on? What does this not work on? So I'm going to the store and I'm buying all of these different textures of things and all of these different colors and scanning all of them and sending all of these messages to our engineers. I'm like, okay, so it works on this kind of beach ball, but not on this kind of beach ball. Or it works on this couch, but it doesn't work on this couch. (laughs) And I seriously can't believe somebody paid me to do it. Um, it was it was so cool, and I am wildly thrilled with how the product turned out. It was absolutely amazing. Um, it definitely, definitely a highlight. Well, I mean, you want to talk baptism by fire? Power Rangers is a that's a that's a rough one to start. I, I, and you know, full disclosure, like my knowledge of my like breadth of Power Rangers knowledge kind of ends when. The movie came. That first movie came out, like the the one with Ivan Ooze in it. With Ivan Ooze, you mean yeah. your Power Rangers knowledge is from 1993 to like 1995? Pretty much. <laughs> okay, perfect. Pretty much. Got it. <laughs> because that's when I when I watched it. Like, yeah, I was the right sense. age. I and was I the, only knew it from you. Yep. So yeah. And I was I was the right age for it. And then by the time you know the movie had come out, I I was already hop skipping and jumping onto something else. You know yeah. the the next the next big fad. So. When we started doing the, the blog and the podcast and, and everything, Power Rangers w- was one of those properties where it was like, how do we cover this? Yeah. <laughs> because we need to, you know, we want to make sure that we're getting the information out there accurate, you know, from, you know, from Hasbro. And, you know, it's the same. There, there are a couple of other, we'll, we'll keep, we'll keep the other, the other cards hidden, but like there are a couple of brands out there that we're not experts in. Yeah. And part of the, kind of joy of this is is learning about so much of it and i mean like i have you know uh shout out to to friend of the pod uh and and so actually somebody that you know uh dave, dave p he, he stood in for us at that uh at the the gi joe round table oh yeah yeah um he he is our our power rangers uh go-to so everybody when, when is I have, a power rangers uh, go-to man when, when we have when we have questions, he's he's the one we go to. Um, he sends me YouTube clips all the time, so that way I have context for the things that I'm talking about. Um, yeah, well, I'd be I'd be we'd be we'd be lost without out Dave. So shout, shouts to Dave. And I think it's yeah. one of the things that's also really cool about Power Rangers is that depending on when you were born and what it really depends on like what seasons you watched as a kid. And mm-hmm. those are the seasons you have the strongest affinity for. And so you get people like out of left field going like Turbo's the best Power Rangers season ever. I'll fight you about it. And it, but people are so passionate about what they identify as like their seasons, like their nostalgia seasons. Uh, and so it was really, really cool to get to see like this fandom that's basically evolved over 30 years, which is bonkers show's been on forever um but it was so cool i will admit um my heyday was mmpr i very distinctly remember playing power rangers on the playground in first grade um my first crush that i can remember was actually on the pink ranger um and i 
it was so cool to get to work on a brand that I actually remembered from when I was a kid. Um, it was a very fun experience. I don't know if you guys probably didn't have any reason to be watching this, but Loretta and I did a Fan First Friday back in last June for our pink Power Ranger capsule. Totally that- watched it. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. At, so at the very, very end, for anybody who may have not watched it, I knew that I was moving off the brand. And I was like, all right, I'm going to do something ridiculous. So we had just announced a helmet and a morpher, and we had a costume. And I convinced them to let me morph into the pink Power Ranger at the end of the segment. And seriously, like a career highlight. <laughs> I could not believe they let me do that. Amazing. Love it. Awesome. Yeah, it brought me a lot of joy. <laughs> So, so moving moving from Power Rangers onto your your current role, the GI Joe brand is is easily one of the most cherished and uh, and storied in in, in toy history. Um, you know, arguably one of the most important too. So, what are some of the challenges you and the team face leading a brand like GI Joe into 2022 and beyond? Yeah, I think that one of the very cool things about GI Joe, much like Power Rangers, is that we have all of this history to draw from on the brand. And you have hundreds and hundreds of established characters who have been in TV shows and movies and comic books. And that there are so many different kind of versions of these characters that exist along the way that sometimes I think we get a little bit bogged down in character selection. We're like, oh my gosh, but there's like a hundred characters that we feel are like a level that we need to include immediately. And how do we kind of pare down and what makes the most sense to include together from like a storytelling perspective? And I have learned so much from the team in the last seven months. I am so lucky. The G.I. Joe team is has been an amazing, amazing team to work with. We we all communicate so well. We work so well together. We all ask such good questions. Nobody's ever mean when they have to answer questions. Not that any of the other teams at Hasbro have ever worked on have been mean about answering questions. But I think about some of my other workplaces that weren't Hasbro and how it never really felt like the team I was on was meshing together and the G.I. Joe team just meshes, man. Um, and so I think that we have we have a lot of fun working together um, and it results in these amazing conversations about where we can evolve the line. And it's so cool to get to be kind of one of the shepherds of the brand and get to help figure out how, you know, like everybody who grew up in the 80s, like Real American Hero, those three and three quarter inch O-ring figures, like that's their G.I. Joe. And kids who grew up in the 2000s, you know, had modern era retro, like that's their version of G.I. Joe. And you have, you know, Renegades and you have Six Sigma and you have the live action movies. And so just like with Power Rangers, depending on where you grew up, you have different nostalgia touch points. Or some kids may have never watched the TV show, but religiously read the comics. Mm -hmm. And so it's just so cool to have so much amazing history to draw from. And so I think going into 22 and beyond, you know, as we've said, we're, we love getting to kind of deep, deep dive into GI Joe history, but still getting to bring a little bit of that modern edge to it um, has been really amazing. So how do we, how do we respect the history, but, you know, bring it, bring it into the, the new millennium. Which is a so, phrase that I haven't said since like 2000. So you're welcome. <laughs> Y2K. Yep. Oh my gosh. Speaking of Y2K, fashion is like really in for spring, guys. Oh. Just to put it out there. Yeah. <laughs> I have a feeling that will be a relevant statement shortly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned the uh, three and three quarter O ring Joes coming back, and uh, we saw that reintroduction this past year. And a super successful HasLab campaign for the Sky Striker. Um, how did you come up with the uh, surprise Cobra takeover in it incentive? Um, how did the team come up with that as as the idea to kind of drive things home? Oh, I loved the Cobra takeover. Um, so before I kind of go in on this, anybody who's listening and helped to back the Sky Striker, thank you so much for your support. We literally could not have done it without you, and we are we're so thankful for this amazing community. Um, and really, really excited to bring you all your Sky Strikers to fly them home. Um, they're they're really cool. <laughs> We're still in um, kind of pre production, but we will have updates soon um, on kind of what next steps are on the Sky Striker, so that we can get backer updates and all of that good stuff. 
Shouts to Carson from 3D Joe's, who I know got at least five. Yeah, thanks, Carson. (laughs) I would like to see. So the real question for Carson is, how many is he going to take out of boxes? I listen. That that man has an incredible museum of. I, I there there have been times where we've been on on roundtable discussions with him, and I get distracted looking at his feed because I'm trying to figure out what's behind him in a in a given moment. Oh, now I'm gonna have to go look. That sounds amazing. I just got um one of the. I feel like it's important to know your history, so I just got one of the like collectors books that lists like every G.I. Joe from like 1980 to like 2000. Nice. Um, and my, my personal goal for myself, I haven't announced this out loud yet, but I would like for somebody to be able to show me one of the pictures from the book and for me to be able to identify which character it is. Wow. Um, so that's, that's okay. a long-term goal. So maybe someday in the future, we'll be able to do like some flashcard toy recognition for GI Joes so that I can flex my, my super cool GI Joe character knowledge. Oh man, um, ha- see having you and Lenny do that would be hilarious. Oh my gosh, we'd be yes. All right, that'll be good. Maybe we'll do it in a yeah. All right, he's gonna he would do so much better than me. <laughs> um, I can't wait. So I will be the underdog in that situation, but we'll have fun. We'll be rooting um, for you. Sorry, Lenny. Yeah, thank you. No, it's it's he has so many people <laughs> rooting for him. I come onto my team. Uh, so the the Cobra hack was so we we were envisioning and I think I've mentioned this somewhere before but we were kind of envisioning it like a an episode of Real American Hero right so the whole show hinges on the conflict between the Joes and the Cobras so we're like okay if we have say the central plot revolves around a Sky Striker what is some kooky stuff that Cobra could do to this Sky Striker like what could be the central plot of this show. And so we're like, what if they steal it? And basically the idea would be that they're not going to, they're definitely not going to paint the jet, right? They're going to want to make sure that the GI Joes know that they have it. They want to taunt them with it. So we came up with the idea of instead of doing like a total redeco, I'm imagining like in a Cobra hangar, you have the Cobra grounds crew guys, right? And they're like graffiti spraying Cobras on this sky striker, um, the easily the best decal in that sticker set for the Cobra stickers is the no Joe sticker. I died. (laughs) I was Mm -hmm. like, this is, this is Mm -hmm. phenomenally good. Um, And so that's basically coming up with kind of the plot of a, an imagined episode of real American hero is how we came up with the Cobra hack. Well, it was brilliant. And I mean, the the delivery on it too, the, the voice actor that you guys got to do the, the Cobra voice was just, just shrill shrill enough to be perfect yeah absolutely perfect um and that was totally a secret weapon of john warden um who ended up being friends with um frank todaro um which was amazing and it just absolutely worked out in the best way possible yeah and and you know what it's one of those things where like you know Sure, like it, the 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 extra figures and everything definitely, you know, added value. You know, as as mm-hmm. you know, unlock uh, not even as an unlockable, really as a, as a bonus, right? Mm-hmm. Added added value, but also I'm sure for many, put people in a position where they're like, well, now I need two of these. Exactly. Because yeah. now <laughs> you're really gonna choose between having a GI Joe Sky Striker and a Cobra Sky Striker, and now you have enough figures. Where really you could have so many different kind of figure loadouts of who's flying. Um, I'm not going to say that that wasn't something that ran through my mind. <laughs> I mean, hey, it, at the at the end of the day. I mean, I am a marketer. Like, it's kind yeah. of my job. Like, I wouldn't really be doing my job if I didn't think that kind of stuff through. But thank you to everybody who upped your Sky Striker orders when we announced the Cobra Takeover. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Listen, we've we've had we've had Ryan Ting on the show before, and he's the biggest proponent of buy two, one on card, one loose. Yep. So you know, Ryan it, is absolutely amazing. It's so it's my figures worth two and one, and that's just you know you need two. Yeah. Yep. So now just basically, two. what you end up needing is like how many figures did we end up with? Seven, I think. Yeah. You just need seven. Yeah. Um, it is. It's my personal policy at Hasbro that I am, I support all of the Haslabs that the teams do because I know how much work goes into these and how much effort people have 
blood, sweat, and tears, metaphorically, on the blood, probably not on the tears. But to get to that point where we can put them out in front of people and say, hey, guys, we have something really cool that is going to blow your mind. It's so important to me to kind of create this pan Hasbro camaraderie and really like show the teams that I am supporting them. Um, which I think is great. Definitely my so excited for my proton pack. <laughs> I was just gonna say that that that's one that uh that I know yeah. Dave is looking forward to. Personally I'm 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 looking forward to my Razor Crest. Which oh be, yeah. That was soon. so the Razor Crest was I think right in a period right before I started buying all the Haslab. So I missed out on the Razor Crest. So I will live vicariously through you. Oh, there will be lots of pictures because the, the, the three and three quarter inch Star Wars, that's... Yeah, that's, that's your jam. My, my bread and butter. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, I, I had uh, got uh, the, the Neutrona wand for my girlfriend to co- like the Christmas that that came out. And I was like, all right, here it is. I got to We got to do this now. Yeah. Well, I mean, and, if you already uh, have the wand, was, that's like half the setup. So yeah, it would be sure. criminal to not do it. I'm very excited to see the whole thing in action. Yeah. And for those of you who don't have your Neutrona wands, Hasbro Pulse Plug, they just went back up for pre-order on HasbroPulse.com. And now, a word from our sponsors. Did you know Amazon provides ways of working that fits your lifestyle? They know you value your time outside of work, juggling family, school, friends, or other activities. That's why they offer a variety of shifts that work for you. There are full-time, part-time, and even temporary opportunities that can work with your schedule. With great starting pay and sign-on bonuses, if you want a career that fits and adapts to your lifestyle, head to Amazon.com slash apply. Amazon is a proud equal opportunity employer. And now back to the show. Moving from the three and three quarter inch O-ring figures to the classified line, um, something that reinvigorated my love for for GI Joe. Frankly, um, D- Dave was the the GI Joe collector when we were kids. I mostly mm-hmm. played with his uh, his GI Joes once once he had kind of moved off of them. But the um, the classified line is really what kind of what kind of drew me in. And uh, it it won the second place uh, second place in in our first annual Archie Awards. Woo-hoo! So you know everyone who voted the the final matchup came down between uh, GI Joe Classified and and Marvel Legends, which and G- we're totally honored to have made it that far in the competition and to be considered second best to Marvel Legends, which is an astonishingly amazing toy line. So thank you guys. And if you want to send me a certificate, I will hang it prominently in our Hasbro <laughs> offices. <laughs> We're, we're 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 working on getting the trophy made for next year. Oh my getting, gosh! Getting well, now I really of, want some it. Some kind of trophy, some kind of trophy situation yeah. happening. We're we're working yeah. on it. Can it be like a repurposed like soccer team trophy? Because I feel like that would be like really nice. We have some ideas. I'm gonna leave it <laughs> yeah. at that. Leave it at that. <laughs> I love it. Okay, perfect. Can't wait to find out. But you're coming in hot off of the brand's uh, first Fan First Friday of, sure of 2022. Um, and you had a ton of reveals, including some some really, really sought-after fan favorites like Stalker, Tomax, and, and, and uh, Zamet. There we go. <laughs> That's how it is. Uh, and, uh, and you revealed them a little bit differently than, than you have uh, in the past. So tell us a, a little bit about how this year's announcements will, will be coming to fans. Yeah. So first off, I want to say thank you so much to everybody who tuned in for our first Fan First Friday. And both Lenny and I were overwhelmed with the amount of incredibly kind messages that we were getting from people, thanking us for our transparency and for kind of our what we're doing on the brand and all the figures. And so thank you to everybody who's kind of sticking with us during this. Um, And for all of your kind words, we had to turn our Instagram notifications off because we were getting so many of them, which sounds like a humble brag. And now that the words have come out of my mouth, it feels a little braggy. Um, But it was, we totally (laughs) blown away. Thank you. Um, Deserve it. You you, you earned that one. (laughs) Very kind of you. Um, so the, so basically this fan first Friday kind of set up the cadence for us to expect for the rest of the year. So like we mentioned, you know, the world is kind of still a crazy place. There's still supply chain issues. There are so many, uh, so many delays with kind of manufacturing with those supply chain issues. And so we are, we're really, really excited to be able to roll out this kind of new cadence to expect. And so what this set up was really kind of the first touch points on our products, because we are 
we get really excited when we're designing stuff and we really want to share them with you as soon as possible because the odds of us accidentally leaking something just by getting excited and talking about it, like increase exponentially the closer we get to actually launching things. And which I know you guys like actually wouldn't mind, but I mind it a little bit because I have all these things planned out. Um, so the the first reveal now, the first reveals now will actually be those kind of standing figure only digital renders um, that don't include accessories, don't include packaging, um, not really talking about, you know, where where these items are existing within the line. But we want to show you what we've been working on. We want to show you the characters. We want to show you their outfits. And, you know, small things may end up changing between when you see the digital renders and when you get final products. Um, but we're we're so excited to be able to kind of share them with you early and give you a little bit of a, a look behind our design process, which is really kind of what this is. Um, so then the next touch point, so at a later date after those reveals, all of the items that we are revealing will be pre-ordered. This is not going to be like one of those the kind of bat and alley viper situation where we revealed everything and then kind of the pre-orders were up to different companies on how they wanted to do that. This will be a structured pre-order for each of the items. Um, and so at the next kind of the next event touch point or the next, whenever it's time for these items to be pre-ordered, I should say, um, we will do kind of a traditional pre-order with them. So we'll have the figures in hand. We'll have all of their accessories. We'll have those beautiful diorama shots. We'll have the packaging. We'll have the classified series, artist collection, artwork to talk about. We'll talk about retailer distribution and dates and prices and kind of all of that good stuff at that event, at which point we will open pre-orders. Um, as I mentioned last week, oh my gosh, time flies, <laughs> is that we kind of expect with the supply chain issues to have a little bit longer lead times with those for getting those pre-orders fulfilled and the likelihood that you'll have a, like overlapping pre-orders over the course of the year will be higher, um, but that we are doing everything in our power to get stuff to you guys as soon as humanly possible. We know you're excited, we are excited, um, and we cannot wait for you to see what we've been working on. Yeah, I mean, all all of that is awesome. I Personally, I love seeing those digital renders first, especially... I know, I know there, are, and and I think rightfully so. There, are some people have gripes. They don't want to pre-order something that's just a digital render. They want to be mm -hmm. able to kind of see, you know, at least like a a, a, f a final prototype, something in hand before they they click the pre-order button. Totally understand. Like a, that is a, a, to me at least, it's a I think it's a valid gripe. Oh, absolutely. But, yeah. But I love seeing the digital renders, especially after speaking, you know, with somebody like like we had, you know, when we had Tony on the pod. Because we're getting to see that end of the work, you know, that part of the creation mm -hmm. process and, you know, showing off another artist on the team's, you know, role. Like a lot of times that gets completely skipped over. Yeah. And I think f for fans and collectors, like I, I, I almost, that's like a special feature. You know, I'm dating myself, special feature on a DVD, right? Like, yeah, you, that's you a get great to, way to think about it. You get yeah. to see this extra step, you know, leading to the thing that you will eventually, you know, pre order, you know, and the and thing that you'll that eventually it's... get to see. And I think that this is kind of the best of both worlds, right? Because you get the digital renders that Tony has so lovingly put together for us, which like, shout out to Tony. He is on all of my brands with me that I have ever been on. And I'm sure that he is <laughs> sick and tired of seeing me in meetings, but he is always so wonderful. He is one of my favorite people to get to work with. So hi, Tony. I'm sure you're listening. Um, thank you for everything. And but then, so you get the digital kind of preview, but then you actually get the actual pre-order where you will get to see things in hand. You'll get to see the diorama shots with the physical picture or the physical figures in them. You'll get to see what all the packaging looks like. So you'll get to kind of see that whole package. But it's like, we've been thinking of it as kind of like the teaser, the teaser. Of yeah, the I was going to say, it's like the yeah. teaser before the, the year before the movie comes yes, out. Yes, exactly. Only, like yeah. Um, but we're we're really excited about it. And it was really wonderful to see kind of all the positive feedback and that it is, it's really important to me that I know, you know, there have been some, some issues with distribution on this brand in the past, but that we are really working hard to make sure that that is not a problem. We are making so many of these figures. We promise that there'll be plenty of pre-order opportunities for them. We promise if you pre-order, there will be figures available for you. Um, but that it's going to be one of those, as I had mentioned before, a, a a trickle instead of like a huge hit of figures for a lot of these. 
And so I know that the spirit storm shadow wave has started to kind of trickle out for some places and that there, we promise that there will be more of those figures, um, but that it's just going to take a while. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think collectors are starting to get a little bit more used to that because it's, it's not something that's unique to GI Joe yeah. at this point. I mean, it's, it's a new normal almost, which is mm-hmm. not something that we ever thought we'd be yeah. saying, but the world is different than when we were selling action figures a year ago or two years ago or five years ago. It is a very kind of different ball game. And, and unfortunately it's, it's a butterfly effect, you know, yeah, the, exactly. the, the, yep. the, 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 the small things that are affecting you know, or the, the, the small thing pieces that are missing are affecting way more than just the toy industry. But I mean, those things impact everything, yeah. you know, every, everything is delayed. Everything is, it has a longer lead time, but, Again, I, I think, uh, you know, as long as we can all get our toilet paper at a, yes. at a steady pace. I think Let's we prioritize be all right. the toilet paper, shall we? I feel yeah. like that's really what's most important here. I'm, I'm just very pumped about the twins being, uh, being out yes. to Max and Zamet. Oh. Like, that they were two of my favorite figures when I was younger, um, when, when those came out on the original line. Yes, brother. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're just... It like in the the very first episode. So full disclosure on this, I I don't remember if I mentioned this at the round table, but I I did not watch G.I. Joe growing up. And the first time that I ever watched a cartoon related to G.I. Joe was the community episode that they did, G.I. Jeff. Um, that was a G.I. Joe spoof. And so I like I went back and watched it again after I started watching or working on the brand. I was like, oh my God, this is so much funnier this time around. Because for those of you who haven't watched it, the whole premise is that like the lead character of community is going through a midlife crisis. He's turning 40. And so he, they turn into a GI Joe cartoon. And basically what happens at the very beginning of the episode is, you know, the Joes are fighting against the Cobras. I don't remember if it was Destro or Zartan or somebody, but GI Jeff ends up shooting them. And it actually like, you know, in real American hero, nobody ever gets hurt. Nobody, unless you're a bat, but that's okay because you're a robot. But it actually, like, killed him. And so the whole rest of the episode is basically this tribunal about how nobody's supposed to be able to, like, die in this universe and how it's a safe space. <laughs> and so they they end up the, – the real Joes and the real Cobras end up teaming up against the G.I. Jeff community team. Um, and it's, like, way funnier now that I know what's going on in the brand. I thought it was funny the first time, but it's downright hilarious now. Um, and so at the – when the teams team up, they go, yo, Joe, bruh. And so every time I go, yo, Joe, I'm always like, no, 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 don't say yo, Joe, bruh. You're going to embarrass yourself. <laughs> so that's oh my, my that's my plug to go back and watch that old episode of Community. Yeah, I, I it, that needs some revisiting. Yeah, it's, um, I think that it's, I know that it got kind of mixed reviews when it came out, but I think it's hilarious. Like that is that's peak humor for pop culture right there for G.I. Joe right now. And it it poked fun of us in a way that I think is really wonderful that we as a brand are in a place where we're like, yeah, we can make fun of that. This is really great. Um, I mean, anyway. you named the crocodile. That's, yeah. <laughs> that's it right there. The crocodile. That was all Lenny. <laughs> um, I... I single Lenny's name. responsible for for Fiona. That's... Lenny is Lenny is responsible for Fiona being called Fiona, and for the babies, what are they? El Diablo, and the other oh one has a, a very normal name. I I, um, I love that that, and that big New Jersey great, man though. so much. Yep. Um. And it is Fiona is one of the first figures. Like every once in a while, when you're when you're looking at figures for things. You just kind of stop after, you know, you you guys have seen a lot of action figures. And every once in a while, you just kind of stop and you go, oh, my God, that's amazing. And it's something that you've never seen before or it's something that's new or there's some new technique. I had that same feeling the first time I walked into the model shop and saw the the shark from the, from the Fortnite line. Mm. And I was like, oh, my God, that's amazing. But that... That is that is the exact reaction I had the first time I saw Fiona. 12 inches long, just like hanging out. I was like, oh my God, this is an amazing thing that we have created. 
Um, and I think that that's a really magical moment because when you're kind of working on things day in and day out, you're like, are people really going to like this? But the the reaction that we saw to Crocmaster and Fiona was out of this world. And basically the consensus is that it's it's Fiona with a bonus Crocmaster. Like Fiona steals the show. So full disclosure, when I, I was talking with Lenny prior to that, you know, way prior to that announcement. And, you know, we were we were just talking offline and, you know, going over some of the characters that, like, you know, we, we, we loved from the original line. And, and I, you know, he totally did not give anything away. Like, he was, he was a steel trap. But I mentioned how awesome a Croc Master figure would be in, in you know, the, uh, the, the classified line. And I didn't even mention a crocodile. Like, mm-hmm. I was just thinking, like, the deco and, like, the way that, you know, the kind of modernization, like, how awesome Croc Master would be. Uh-huh. And when you guys announced that, I, like gasped because i was like my favorite gi joe i'm it's it's happening and then i was like but look at that crocodile yeah like, i uh-huh. literally com- was like yeah Cro- croc master would love to- i want to see the crocodile because when when you guys put out the the snake eyes and timber two i was pack, gonna say timber yeah it, it's it was the same thing it was like oh cool my this wolf comes with a free yeah. snake eyes figure Neat. cool um, bonus b- because this really cool wolf with a bonus wolf head like yeah because because we don't see articulated animals like that like yeah. in in any really in in i i mean i guess like three and three quarter inch star wars like has had some some really cool like beasts and 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 aliens and animals but like they're they're out of this world right like there are these super fictional crazy alien monster things we don't get like 112 scale animals yeah and and one I of think- the really cool things is that it's they're so kind of relatable that I'm I'm a really big proponent of mixing your action figures. I mm-hmm. I do not think that you need to keep brands separate. I like the weirder the combinations of things, the happier I am. And, but like Timber, Wolf, Fiona, Crocodile, so easy to mix with other brands and really kind of add that to like your dioramas, to your shelf setups. And I think that that's also one of the really wonderful things that we've been doing in the line is so many things are not necessarily like hyper specific to G.I. Joe Um, and that there is a lot of, you know, like the the accessories that we include in figures like those look great with any six inch figures that you're you're working with. Um, And so I think that there's a lot of compatibility across the line, which is really nice. And and I think too for for many people it it, sh- it opens up the door right because it yeah. shows like oh well you know they successfully did a one twelve scale wolf and you know this is Hasbro and you know it's it's an owned Hasbro product and like mm-hmm. think about like cross teams like how you know the engineering that's now done for a wolf body how that can Im- impact other lines how it can impact additional you know four legged creatures in the G.I. Joe line, because, you know, there's, you know, characters like Law and Order mm-hmm. and, you know, so many other, uh, you know, dog and, and animal friends, right? It, it's just, it, it's, it, it was, a, it was a very cool moment. And I'm, I'm you know, we're, we're excited for more, more beasties for sure. The other baby's name is George. I just remembered <laughs> El Diablo and George. 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 Oh, Lenny. <laughs> right. <laughs> Lenny's the best. <laughs> yeah, it's, it has been. It's really, really cool to get to work on this stuff. Like this is, and you're right, it's something that nobody else is really doing for animals right now. And I think that it's really cool that we get to be one of those brands that kind of brings that to your collections. And I think Crocmaster, I still haven't seen final samples yet. Mine's um, an engineering prototype, but a um, I cannot wait to get final samples in of Crocmaster. Like it, they're going to be amazing. And then I can't wait to like see people start getting them. And, you know, it's one thing to see me on a big screen saying, it's a 12 inch crocodile. Look at how amazing this is. You can squish her belly. It's kind of squishy, but it's like a totally different ball game. If you have it in your hands and you're like, oh my God, this is amazing. Like I want people to have that same reaction that I had the first time that I saw that figure. And like Croc Master, don't get me wrong. Croc Master is a dope action figure, but if you put Croc Master and Fiona next to each other, just for sheer, like, I have never seen this before, you are going to gravitate to Fiona, like, 90% of the time. So one of the other things we saw at the event um, was some of the retro-inspired classified figures for the 40th anniversary. 
Um, will there be more announced for the anniversary? And when can we expect to hear more? Well, gosh, we have a lot of really amazing anniversary kind of programs planned. Um, and so I mentioned kind of briefly in the last Fan First Friday, we are going to be doing a, our big 40th anniversary kickoff event at the end of February. Um, we should be able to announce that date really soon. But kind of everybody should get stoked. We're doing some really cool stuff. And it's it's not just Hasbro product, which is really fun. So we're really bringing in like our entire brand activation. Um, so it's kind of a, a well-rounded um, event, which will be very, very fun um, and excited for everybody to get to learn more. I know that that's like really mysterious, um, but I think that everybody, trust me, you'll be pleased. There'll be, what I can say is there'll be product reveals and there will be product pre-orders that activate that day. Awesome. Yep. So we do have some questions from, uh, you know, in, in our Q&A from our, uh, our, the members of our audience and some of our followers on, on Instagram and whatnot. However, before we get there, we have a short game to play with you. So we know that you have an eye for fashion. It's something that you've, you've, we've mentioned already that you like to call out on, on figures and characters, you know, as you're kind of describing them and showing them off and, and revealing them. So we thought we would play a quick round of this or that, the action figure fashion edition. So in this game, uh, we'll, Dave and I will go back and forth and we'll give you uh, a choice of two characters. And you are going to tell us which character has the better look headed into spring 22. I can't wait. Very excited. I hope there's some Y2K fashion choices in there since that's what I know about. <laughs> oh, we've, we've got, some, we've got some, uh, some, some violently colored figures. Hey, Bold is in for this season, so that may work <laughs> out for them. They could be the winners. All right, Dave. Do you want to do you want to go with the first one here? Yeah, I could start. Um, so our first one is Goldar or Pudgy Pig. Ooh. Okay. So Fringe is really kind of king going into twenty two. So there's kind of a lot of movement. And personally, I think that Pudgy's kind of weird gladiator hat situation is a little more evocative of a fringe, especially like an, in a bold color. Goldar's wings are really nice, but kind of a darker tone. That bold isn't really popping the way that I'd like. So I'm going to go with pudgy for bold color choice and fringe-like gladiator hat situation. Your next one is... Uh, is <laughs> <laughs> I was not expecting that answer, and I'm I'm. Was I that like way more thoughtful need, than you thought it was going to be? I, yes, and I need a moment to recover. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so your next one uh, is is Destro or Profit Director Destro. I'm not going to lie, Profit Director Destro is one of my favorite action figures that I've ever seen, and there is no way that a flaming pile of money is out of style. Or like, a, is that cheetah? Is it leopard? It's definitely a dead cat cape. And as much as I am against the killing of cats, I'm going to assume that it was a leopard and or cheetah that died of natural causes and was made into his cape. Um, and so I'm going to go with flaming pile of money, profit director Destro. <laughs> it's, that figure is awesome. All right. Power Rangers in space or Mighty Morphin Power Rangers? So interestingly, one of the trends that we're seeing for the spring is actually a, and I know, bear with me guys, the combination of like space age and athleisure. And you may be asking yourself, what is she talking about? But if you Google it, it's actually kind of a really interesting combination. So you get kind of the cool kind of alien-like outer space situation combined with like the kind of clothes you'd want to hang out and work from home in. Um, so I'm gonna go in space for their on point use of both being in space and wearing spandex suits, which I think technically counts as athleisure. Count it. So we're headed, headed back to the G.I. Joe's for the next one. Uh, two, two ladies of the, of the G.I. Joe team, Scarlet or Lady J? I'm going to give this one to LJ because green is one of the real colors of spring. So you're going to see kind of Bold pops of green in shoes, especially accessories and even full outfits. So Lady J is definitely on trend with that bold green look. All right. The best fashionable pet companion, mm. Fiona or Timber? So to me, Timber feels very winter. Timber is like 
I'm gonna curl up with my pet wolf in front of my fireplace and read a good book. But Fiona, Fiona says Florida. Fiona says optimism, sunshine, which I think is really what we need heading into spring. It's been a long winter. Let's kind of celebrate with that feeling of optimism and being outside, which is really an ironic thing for me to be saying about a figure that comes with a meat hook to hold your crocodile's mouth open with. But I'm going to go Fiona. (laughs) Um, Next up is Rita Repulsa or Astronema. So this one I'm torn between because they both are really representative of two big trends right now. So oversized, Rita Repulsa is actually doing great with this kind of caftan muumuu situation that she's got going on. And if you kind of look at the coloring, her feather collar kind of a vibe is actually a little bit of that green tone in a bold color. So really she has the green accessory and the oversized. Astronema, 1980s are making a big comeback right now. So we're seeing a lot of the kind of the opulence of the 20s and the 80s coming back in two different ways. Remember how I was talking about fringe with pudgy? So you see the fringe coming in from the 20s and you see kind of the neon colors and like the just over the topness of the 80s because everyone's been wearing sweatpants for two years. We want to feel a little fancy. And Astronomer's wig collection is one of the strongest hair games in the Power Rangers universe. And so I think for just sheer amazing hairstyle situation, I'm going to go with the 1980s and give it to Astronema. Dave, Dave, you're up next. We have Snake Eyes or Storm Shadow. So interestingly, one of the big trends, you know how I've been talking about, you know, bold, white, bold colors, a lot of neons, a lot of like those kind of vibrant greens, other trend kind of going in the opposite direction is kind of an all monochromatic white look. So we're really feeling this kind of evocative bridal sense. So like a lot of lace, we're seeing a lot of the um, kind of the handcrafted techniques coming back, quilting, embroidery, kind of crochets, chunky knits. And so while Storm Shadow isn't exactly in a chunky knit ensemble, he definitely is an all white, which is a little evocative of that bridal trend. So I think uh, I'm gonna give it to Storm. Wow. All right, Storm Shadow gets 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 it for a bridal trend. So, somewhere, someone is really angry, and I'm. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd like to hear them in the comments. <laughs> yes, please. All right, our last one, and and this is actually my my favorite of the bunch. I cannot wait, um, <laughs> because there is so much going on with both of these figures that is just bananas, like bananas there choices. <laughs> um, <laughs> the Alley Viper. Or the, or the, I need goggles for my helmet, Cobra Island Viper. <laughs> so both of them are really kind of working a couple of the trends. So we're seeing a lot of kind of big accessories, kind of a go big or go home. <laughs> I never noticed the goggles for my helmet. <laughs> oh, it's the best. It's the best. <laughs> That's really good. All right. <clears throat> Get it together, Emily. Um, that's beautiful. I literally, I had never noticed that before. I'm never gonna look at that figure the same. Um, all right, amazing. Um, I'm sure it's for you know when you when you raise your helmet up, you want to make sure that your eyes are still covered because it's like a secret identity sort of situation. Um, or sometimes the glare is just that bad. It's just really bad, yeah. guys. Um, so, Ali Viper. Face. Is- <laughs> Alley Viper is really kind of rocking that bold color trend. The Alley Viper, when the Alley Viper is going out, the Alley Viper wants to be seen. The Alley Viper is not hiding in the background. This is a, a loud, bold fashion statement to draw fire away from the named Cobra characters and allow them to escape. <laughs> the Cobra Island Viper, also bold fashion statement. Those red accessories, on point for this season. That overabundance of accessories, including those the goggles for his helmet, on trend for this season. Um, you know what? I'm I may declare this one a tie. I'm not sure I can choose who is rocking this trend better. So for our final, this is a tie. Oh man. I just I you, you get it. You get the. You get the round of applause. Thank you for taking us down the, the plastic red carpet. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would love to do this again sometime. That was a lot of fun. S- somewhere, Joan Rivers is laughing at all of this, and, oh, yeah. and that's it's just, it's just making <laughs> me very happy. Going, you interpreted the trends wrong. <laughs> 
I just like uh, how he has <laughs> goggles for his helmet. He does. It's, it's and his accessory game is on point, guys. We cannot deny yeah. that. And and it's again, it's just one of those. It's one of those dumb attention to details. Like the 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 original figure had goggles on top of his helmet, and yep. the, the classified figure had. I just yep. Well, you yeah, know, you gotta stay. To have it. You gotta stay consistent to the original, right? Oh my goodness! <laughs> There's, it's so much fun getting to kind of pick and choose what are the like, what are the important details to us, like what stands out on those figures, and what we really want to make sure translates to their kind of updated classified version. Um, glorious, yeah, pretty amazing. Now it's time for our Q and A. This segment is brought to you by our friends at Chubsy Wubsy Toys. A traditional mom-and-pop toy store in Little Falls, New Jersey, Chubsy Wubsy Toys brings you the best new toys from the brands you love without the hassle of pounding the pavement, searching for them at larger retail stores. Visit them in person at 106 Main Street in Little Falls, New Jersey, or online at ChubsyWubsy.com. That's C-H-U-B-Z-Z-Y-W-U-B-Z-Z-Y.com. And tell them Adventures in Collecting sent you. Uh, and for Q&A, we put out a question or a, a post on our, our Instagram and Twitter uh, asking if anyone in the uh, the community had any questions for you. And we have a have a couple. Dave, I'm going to take the first one. I'm going to skip to the end. I'm going to skip to the last one. We're going to do that one first. Um, at GatorDon03. I just realized that's a play on words. GatorDon03. Ah, <laughs> yep, sure is. Uh, Gator Don 03 states, it is. please make sure Emily knows that I'd pay up front for a HasLab USS flag. That is all. Thanks, Gator Don 3. I'll definitely keep that in mind for the future. <laughs> all right, Dave, next one. Um, at Wild Mercy 1 asks, is there a deliberate balance between the Cobra team and Joe team members when determining waves slash assortments? Yeah, I think that, you know, we're all about the storytelling and we want there to be a good balance of you having kind of to simplify good guys and bad guys to play with in your action figure sets. Um, I, much like Steve Evans, am a big proponent of taking your toys out of boxes and playing with them. And so it is our hope. And I mean, please don't take this the wrong way. This isn't this isn't your jam. But it's our hope that you're, you know, actually taking these products out of the boxes and having them hang out together and posing them and playing with them and enjoying them. And we really want to make sure that, you know, you get representation of the way that we think about it is basically the, the, the GI Joes and you have the named Cobra figures and the Cobra troop builders. And so making sure that there is, there's balance there and that there's really a lot of fun interpretive stories that you can do that if your kids are playing with them, if you are a kid who is playing with them, um, that really anybody can enjoy. Uh, at brings toys to work asks, <clears throat> would the GI Joe team ever consider doing a fan poll or vote for deciding on a future classified figures creation? Yeah, I think we definitely would. It's one of my favorite things when we're doing videos and we ask in the comments, like, all right, what kind of figures do you guys want to see next? Know that we actually go back and we read all the comments there. We see what you're saying. And so we definitely are kind of looking at what fan sentiment is and what you're excited about. But I think that that could be definitely something cool in the future. I need to make a bunch of burner accounts and just comment shipwreck a bunch of times. There you go. (laughs) Duly noted. But now I know that it's all going to be you. Or do you? <laughs> it's, a, it's a solid mystery. Good question. <laughs> yeah, just when I thought you let the cat out of the bag. <laughs> you didn't. Um, so at Jersey Maniac Collector asks, has the team thought about doing five or six figure waves like Marvel Legends and the Black Series? Oh, absolutely. We would love to be able to do five or six figure waves like Marvel Legends or the Black Series. You know what Marvel Legends and the Black Series have that we don't yet? An established timeline of being a brand. Guys, this brand came back in 2020. That was two years ago. Um, So we have every intention of continuing to grow the brand and expand it. And someday we would love to be able to do five or six figure waves um, like Legends and Black Series. 
the the number of products that they're able to put out and have their fan collectors be so excited about all of them is amazing. And we really hope that we can get there as a brand someday. But right now we are a baby brand um, that is growing, that we're excited about. But um, I think that we're probably still a little bit off from doing the the big five or six figure waves. And your final question for Q&A comes from at X, the human factor X. And they ask, I would love to see more green shirts and Cobra Troopers in the O-ring line, especially male and female variants with different skin tones. Are those things that are being considered at this point? So let me start off by kind of addressing part of this. So I am a huge proponent for adding additional diversity to the line. I think that there's, and that comes into account a lot of the times when we're doing our character selection, we want to make sure that we are representing to the best of our abilities as many different groups of people as humanly possible. Um, So you'll definitely see that coming into play more with our 2020 line and our 2023 line. Um, And we were really excited about some of the things that we have planned. I think you guys will be really excited too. But those kinds of things are absolutely being considered. We want to make sure that everybody is represented in both classified series and O-rings. And I think that the the ways in which we are figuring out how to accomplish that will be will be really great for collectors to see. Um, but that, you know, everybody deserves toys, even if it's something as silly as a troop builder that's an O-ring figure that look like them, that they can see themselves in. The first time I picked up a, one of the Scarlet figures, one of the first figures that I had, and she had freckles. I went, oh my gosh, I don't remember the last time that I had a doll with freckles. I actually do remember the last time it was an American Girl doll that my mom had custom ordered with freckles so that I had a doll that looked like me. And I know that that's, you know, that's very, that's a very small piece, but it was that moment of, I see myself in this. And I think that that is something that is so important, especially for kids who are growing up to be able to see themselves reflected in toys um, and to see themselves reflected as, you know, I, I am normal. I am, you know, there are other people in the world that are like me and I am, you know, I am perfectly perfect the way that I am is so important. It's also important when we're adults, especially important when we're kids. Um, And so definitely uh, look to start seeing some some additional kind of diversity um, within the G.I. Joe line going forward. And to add on to that, like G.I. Joe is an extremely diverse brand. It is one of my favorite things about it is that it is. But the G.I. Joe and Cobra teams are these mixes of people from all around the world who are coming together. And there's no there's no magic in the G.I. Joe universe like there is in Power Rangers, right? Like these aren't people who have magic powers bestowed upon them by a floating head in a tube, not to disort on or anything. These the people in this universe are they're very, very good at what they do. They are incredibly smart, they are incredibly skilled, they have worked really hard. And so I think that there's a really amazing message here where it's all of these very smart, very talented people who are coming together from all over the world to work together to accomplish goals, whether that is, you know, world domination if you're a Cobra or to prevent Cobra from dominating the world if you're a Joe. But I think that it's so cool to see, you know, there's there's nobody who gets told, no, you can't be a Joe because you came from here or this is what you look like. No, that's not how it works. And and I think that that care was especially evident the way that you guys handled the uh the release of of Spirit and Freedom. Um, mm-hmm. you know, getting Taboo involved and and making, you know, the necessary changes so that his character didn't um, you know, forward uh, you know, stereotypes and and you know, his his background and his history and his specialties like they all made sense and everything was kind of reconfigured in order to to be more uh you know uh respectful to to the character's background and to and to the the uh you know the tribes that he represents so you know k- kudos to that it's it's Thank awesome you. to see yeah. that kind of stuff and it was it was so interesting listening to taboo talk about you know what spirit meant to him when he was a kid and he got to see this native figure and that to him it was it was a big deal And I think it, a lot of people feel like that about when they see figures that are representative of themselves, their communities of things that they identify with and how heartbreaking it is to, to see that and then have like, you know, the biography be kind of a stereotype or there to be things that are 
like a mismatch, a mish, kind of a mishmash of different cultures that don't necessarily go together because maybe at the time there weren't resources to figure out, you know, exactly how to isolate these things. You know, we did like a lot of stuff before the internet. And, but I think that we're in such a wonderful place now where, you know, we have the resources, we are a globally connected world. And if there's something that you don't know, there's always somebody that you can ask. And we can we can make things better and we can make things better and more inclusive experiences for people. And I think that that is – it's something very small that I think that we can – I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not going to solve the world's issues by making our G.I. Joe figures from the 1980s more inclusive and more respectful of cultures. But I think that, you know, it, it can make a big difference to some people and that's really wonderful to get to be part of. Sorry, that's my my diversity and inclusion spiel. <laughs> no, it, it's super uh, important. It's, mm-hmm. And and I, Dave, I forget who said it to us, but somebody somebody in the comments, maybe a, a friend of ours. I I don't recall who, and I'm I'm disappointed that I forgot. But they they said to us, you have to remember, every toy is everybody's is somebody's first toy. That's beautiful. I love mm-hmm. that. And especially when it comes to something that's in a situation where, like, you know, a a, a kid with a, a Native American background, maybe that spirit figure is going to be his first toy. Like, can you imagine yeah. the impact that that has? And like, yeah, in the in the the scale of like global, you know, problems and everything that's going on in the world, that one little victory though is going to make that kid so happy. And that's mm-hmm. something that I, I feel like. We're always trying to remind people, you know, especially like, you know, when, when you know, a, a figure is, a, a common figure is re-released and it's a repaint or a repackage. That figure isn't for everybody, but it is going to be somebody's first action figure. Yeah. And that's something that we have to keep reminding ourselves. These are toys and they, you know, they do make an impact. That's, yeah, they're, it's, they're for everyone and, you know, it's, it's good for everyone to be represented by them um you know that's that's the goal right yeah and i think that it's also i mean that's that's a beautiful sentiment but that it also like kind of on the other side of that is it's entirely possible that the first time some someone who isn't a native american is going to have an interaction with native culture is through a spirit action figure and maybe mm-hmm. reading the biography and seeing what kind of clothes he's wearing. And so, I mean, I did, I read a ton when I was younger. And so for me, reading was a lot of my, you know, it was right when the internet was kicking off dating myself. But that was a lot of my introduction to other cultures was reading. And I mean, I had no idea of double checking to make sure that the things I was reading in books were accurate. Um, but that now we live, but I mean, like that could totally be somebody's first introduction to a culture and how cool to be able to update things so that they would potentially have a better understanding of, of other people. Like, that's beautiful. It's a beautiful thing. Oh, guys, this is so nice. What a weepy note to end on. Well, we're going to, we're going to go back to something that that we talked about at the beginning of the episode to end this episode we're going to bookend it dave as promised would you like to fulfill your role as this podcast's james lipton and ask our final question i sure would our final question that we ask to all of our guests what is your favorite and or strangest piece in your collection it can be one of each or both all right i promised i'd tell you the story of my creepy bride doll all right, so imagine, if you will, a world before COVID, actually a, a world right before COVID in which Emily and her friend take take a little trip to Italy, uh, like the same week as the COVID outbreak. So imagine, if you will, we're walking around in Venice and we, we want to get some souvenirs for our friends back in New York. And so we think, and we know that one of our friends has a, has a, a liking for creepy porcelain dolls. If you're ever into Venice, you know that Venice has a lot of creepy porcelain dolls. But being graduate students, we were cheap. We wanted to make sure we weren't paying a lot of money for a creepy porcelain doll. So I'd been to Venice before. I'd stayed in an apartment. I kind of remembered the area I was in. And there was a little antique store kind of close to where I had stayed. I remembered there being some dolls there. I said, all right, let's go. 
we'll go and we'll see if we can find any dolls. To go to the antique store, there are two boxes. There's one that's like five euros. There's one that's 10 euros. We're like five euro dolls, definitely. And so we're digging through the dolls and we see kind of a, a bride doll, at which point I go, oh, this is interesting. I wonder if our friend would like this bride doll. Um, it's also important to note that on this trip, it was my divorce celebration trip. So inst- instead of getting married, I got divorced um, or split up from my ex. And I went on this trip to Italy when I was supposed to be getting married. So we're like, all right, it's fate. Look, we're going to bring this creepy bride doll back to our friend, Mike. Everything will be great. So I noticed as I picked up this doll that her head was on backwards, right? So I was like, oh, that's bad juju. So I go to twist her head back around, not remembering that vintage porcelain dolls are a little on the fragile side. And so I get her head back around just in time to watch both of her legs fall off. Mm. So I catch one of her legs. The other leg hits the ground and shatters. So this very nice man comes out. And I'm trying speaking to him in like broken, fragmented Italian. I know a little bit of French, so I'm throwing some French in there. My friend Jasmine knows Spanish. We're like trying to cobble together a romance language apology to this man. I try paying him. He's no, no, no. He takes the remnants of this broken doll back behind the counter and he just kind of hangs his head sadly. Doesn't come back out. So we're like, okay, do we leave money? Do we leave? Um, So we left um and walked away and we're like all right we'll go find a doll somewhere else that was mortifying we're never going back there again right and so i'm not sure what went through our heads we'd been drinking a lot of wine and for some reason the next day we thought let's go back to that store i bet he won't remember us <laughs> dressed in and i mean like we travel light we were basically wearing exactly the same clothing um I had like this floral print scarf on both days and bright red lipstick. And we were like these, you know, Americans in the middle of Italy, right? So we go back in the next day, so pleased with ourselves, like flying under the radar, such idiots, so, so wonderful. And we find this other really creepy doll in the five euro doll box, which is this kind of Harlequin baby doll that's kind of has like fluff, kind of a fluffy, stuffy situation going on. So course the same guy working at the store right so we go up to the grazie prego give him his five euros walk out and as we're walking out he goes scusi i'm like oh god does he remember me so he comes out he holds he puts something in my hands and holds his hands on top of them and then leaves and i look and it's the broken pieces of the bride doll that i had broken the day before So she's in three Mm. pieces now. So it's her head, which is completely separate from her body, her torso with her arms attached, and the one leg that didn't break. Mm. And he just, he left with this in my hands. I'm just like, oh my God. Don't like that. So, (laughs) so my friend Jasmine is like, what are we going to do with this? I'm like, we're going to protect this doll with our lives. That's what we're going (laughs) to do. So. The doll had like a place of honor in my bag coming back to the U.S. She has moved houses with me twice. She is always like in the RV when we're driving across the country to move. I'm like, I feel like this doll is a representation of like, if I am ever going to fall in love again, if I'm going to die alone. So this, so the doll has a, a place of honor sitting on my shelves of precious travel memories um, so that I can see her every day and be reminded that she is an important part of my home. Uh, and so she sits with her, her head kind of propped on and her leg laying across the lap of her, her little wedding dress. And, uh, that's the story of my haunted bride doll. What'd you guys think? <laughs> Terrifying. <laughs> was that where you thought I was going to go with that? N- n- no. <laughs> no. No, nobody ever it, thinks that we it is. Got, we got, we got where we needed to, though. <laughs> So, so Dave and I watch a lot of horror movies, and uh-huh. let me tell you, let me tell you, I immediately yeah, uh-huh. thought Annabelle. Oh yeah, <laughs> lots of lots of horror movies start that way, Emily. I oh <laughs> when, yeah, when somebody, intimately when somebody, familiar. I have a forlorn, a forlorn, older person hands you the, the a doll and then just walks away and doesn't <laughs> doesn't let you not take it. That's it's usually not a good sign. Not, she is. Um, do not let this doll out. Like <laughs> yeah, I think that. So one of my goals is actually to 
use my my newfound friends in the toy industry to actually make her another leg and string her back together. Um, I feel like it's part of my atonement in life to give this doll. And, and like, she's not very big. Like, don't imagine her as like, you know, a kind of a a bigger doll. She's like maybe six or seven inches. Um, so she was really compact with all, with all of her parts not attached to her. Um, but she is truly one of the creepiest things I own. This is a job for Lenny. Lenny yeah. can do this. Mm-hmm. Lenny could do this. Tony could probably do this. Corey could probably do this. I oh bet no! I could come together. No, I take that back. This is a job for Corey. Yeah, this and because I'm because I'm one hundred percent a job for Corey because he's also a necromancer. And mm-hmm. if something were to happen, that would be the person that you want in your. He'd quarter. be able to shut it down. And mm-hmm. what I'm really hoping, like the one leg that remains, is I think it's like a porcelain with like kind of a cute little white flat shoe situation. And I'd really like the other leg to be like a cool cyborg leg. I feel like she deserves an upgrade. Oh my god. Don't please don't give this this doll any superhuman abilities. <laughs> <laughs> I she's thank you for listening to my creepy bride doll story. I feel like a, a weight has been lifted off of my chest now that she knows that the world knows about her story. And that also, if something weird happens to me and it's not explainable by like normal goings ons, check the bride doll. Noted. <laughs> so, in order for us to be able to keep tabs on you and make sure that you don't just disappear, um, hashtag check the bride doll. <laughs> oh my I god! I can. Um, so, how about I? I will post a picture of her to my Instagram so that you can see her. Perfect segue. Where yeah. can we find you on the internet, Emily? Perfect. Um, I am uh, more phenomenally Emily on Instagram. Um, feel free to follow me and see any kind of fun G.I. Joe hijinks. If you send me, if you are a, a toy collector or a photographer and you send me one of your stories or your posts, I will always repost it to my account um, on stories or like it and comment because I feel like, you know, we all need to be really supporting each other in this time and it's so cool to be welcomed into this community, and I just really appreciate everybody. Well, Emily, thank you so much for uh, for joining us on 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 the show today. This was amazing. We had a blast. We hope you, hope you had a good time as well. And and there's a lot of things to be excited for for uh, for GI Joe and and beyond this year. So uh, we'll we'll be sure to uh, to keep our eyes peeled for for all the good stuff. Yeah, we will see you in late February. I cannot wait. Thank you, dear listener, for hanging out with us today. Subscribe, rate, and review us wherever you listen, and then tell your friends to do it. Thanks also to Joe Azari, the golden voice behind our intro. Our music is Game Boy Horror by the Zombie Dandies. Find more about them both in our show notes. Follow us on social media at AIC underscore podcast on Instagram and Twitter. Stop by and say hi. Show us your toy hauls and share your toy stories. Maybe we'll talk about it in a future episode. Don't try this at home. Voidware prohibited and some assembly required. Each sold separately, not a flying toy. Consult a physician if your toy run exceeds more than four hours. This has been a non-productive media presentation. Executive producer, Frank Hablawi. This program and many others like it on the Non-Productive Network is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives License. Please share it, but ask before trying to change it or sell it. For more information, visit non-productive.com. Careers at Mayo Clinic are life-changing for employees and for our patients. The Center for Digital Health creates digital products and seamless patient experiences through simplicity, innovation, and the human touch. We are currently hiring in critical areas on our team, including product development, experience design, data and analytics, portfolio management, and more. Join us in the Center for Digital Health. Become part of Mayo Clinic's mission. We inspire hope and create new ways of delivering trusted healthcare solutions for patients around the world. Visit jobs.mayoclinic.org forward slash cdh hyphen jobs to find out more.